Ladies and gentlemen, super excited to bring you a very, very special guest. The one, the only, Derek You, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the podcast. We're super excited to have you here, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. My pleasure, my pleasure. I want to jump right, well, I don't want to jump right into it. We were talking like a little bit off camera for a minute. And this is the first time Derek and I've met. And you talk about, you know, you're balancing a lot. You just have a game release and you have all these inquiries of podcasts and things like that. How do you, number one, how do you balance that in terms of working on the game and then ha making time to do this? Oh, it's tough. Yeah, this is a tough part of game development for me. Like, you know, you spend three to four years just behind the computer, just working on the game. And you're like, oh, I can't wait till this comes out. And, you know, everyone's going to get to play it. And then it's like, as, you know, release approaches, you start getting, um, you know, approached by press and people want to do interviews and stuff. If you're, you know, if you're, if you're lucky, like, like I am to get to that point. Um, and it's really cool, but it's also just such a shift in your day-to-day -day life and what you're used to, you know? And like, as a game developer, like I'm a pretty introverted person. And so I'm much more comfortable just working on the game, you know, talking through Slack and stuff like that. So yeah, it's like, it's just a big shift, I think in terms of like my mentality, but that's kind of, it comes with being an indie developer, I think in particular, because you just have to wear a lot of hats when you're an indie developer, you know, like you're in charge of like your own marketing and stuff. You don't, you know, like I don't have like my own community manager or anything like that. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of doing it all. And so it, a lot of times I do think about it, like being an actor in some ways where like, I have to take on different roles, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like I have to be a different person when I'm like coming up with ideas and I gotta be a slightly different person when, you know, I'm getting like feedback about the game because, you know, all of a sudden I can't be like the super sensitive artist, right? Like I gotta, gotta be, you know, cause it, it can be tough to, I think, get, get like the fire hose of feedback that you do once the game is out and you've got to sift through it. And, you know, sometimes people aren't happy about something in the game. Right. And with like the internet being what it is, you know, uh, they're not necessarily going to like give you the feedback in like the most <laughs> constructive manner. Right. Really? So, yeah. Yeah. Who, who would have thought? Um, so, you know, I kind of have to be like a little more, you know, have a little more like ice water in my veins when I'm, when I'm in feedback mode and stuff like that. So, you know, it's all me, but it's like, I have to kind of like activate different parts of myself. And this is just a part of game development where, it's just much more social and, you know, I'm just getting a lot more feedback. And so, yeah, you know, as I transition from, yeah, release mode to post release, I got to kind of like get in that mindset. Well, it's funny because we got, you know, we got on the camera for a couple of minutes and like you're very dynamic and you mentioned something off camera. You're like, yeah, I'm thinking about maybe streaming a little bit. And, it, you know, and I'm sure you just said that in jest, but like, what are your thoughts behind doing something like that? I, you know, I, I got into Twitch like fairly recently, you know, even though we, we did a lot of work with uh, streamers on Twitch for Spelunky One, like to help us announce it and stuff like I didn't really get into watching Twitch actively and being like a member and, you know, ch you know, chatting and stuff until like a few years ago. And yeah, I've just been watching and I, I realized that a lot of game developers actually stream game development. And it seems fun. It seems like just a, a fun thing to do to, uh, you know, for me to just stream some game development and like chat with people. Yeah. Um, and then and then that that's kind of maybe a way to like, yeah, be be a little more social online, like during the development itself. So and uh, yeah, then maybe when the uh, when it kind of comes to like post release time, I'll be I'll be more ready to, you know. So for you, you talk about being social and things like that. And I think we can all maybe like think about like you working for three to four years on a game, just kind of locked down. But is it really like that for you? Are you what is your when you're in the, the thick of development? Are you like walled off and like it's that's all I'm doing? Um, yeah, I mean, it can be like that, you know, obviously, like I, I spend time with 
my family and like my my IRL friends and stuff like that. Um, you know, a lot of whom are not game developers also. I mean, obviously this year, you know, I've been particularly isolated um, and just focusing on work. But yeah, I, I don't know. I, I tend to, with development and, you know, I like tend to keep it pretty, pretty closed off in, in general. You know, I like to kind of have time for feedback on the game and then a lot of time to just think about the game and work on it with, with the team. You brought up your IRL friends. Do they like have a, an idea of, of the magnitude that you've had on, you know, the games and, and how beloved your games are? Are they just kind of like, oh, that's Derek, like that's what he's doing? Or is it somewhere in between? I think it depends. You know, the ones who, you know, play games will be like, oh my gosh, you know, like I actually saw saw your game on such and such website or I was listening to a you know, like a podcast or watching a video or something and, and it came up and and they think that's cool. But uh, you know, I I don't know. For with my friends, I'm just I'm just me. So it's uh yeah, it's it's good. It's it's humbling, <laughs> which I think which I think is good. But I, I always think it's cool when I when it does reach my friends who like are just casual, casually into games or you know, the ones that like really are not into games at all when they've like actually heard, you know, of something I, I did, like something trickled down to them, then then, you know, I know that that something happened that was good. <laughs> and and this is not the the Derek You personal podcast, but I just gotta ask for you, like when you're not playing games or developing games like what do you do for fun to like recharge your creative energy or what do you do if you have like free time with which a family i know you know can be limited what do you like to do now you know yeah i just i like uh i like hanging out with my family and um you know i mean we we do play lots of games at, at our house um you know my daughter like this year she really got into animal crossing and a lot of nintendo games we play some hardcore stuff too like uh you know she really likes beat-em-ups we play through a lot of beat-em-ups together um for her you know i'm i'm always looking for games where she can play as a female character because that's she, like she it's like really important to her right and so um yeah beat-em-ups are like a type of retro game where most of them have at least like one girl character that she can play as and she loves it and they're pretty you know they're pr actually pretty straightforward you just move around and press a button and, and just start you know wailing on somebody <laughs> yeah you, you gotta tell you gotta tell them like this is not what you do in real life okay <laughs> if you find like a turkey on the street do not pick it up and eat it for health um but yeah no there it's it's a lot of fun and you know i i've got a like a wide variety of uh interest as far as gaming goes and i really like a lot of these old retro games and it's been kind of an interesting challenge i think to find find games to play with her like of, of all kinds so yeah we play nintendo we play like old retro arcade games you know like 16-bit games stuff like that all kinds of stuff do you remember streets of rage 4 actually speaking of beat-em-ups yeah streets of rage 4 was like one of her favorite games this year she loved playing as uh, Blaze and Cherry, and um, yeah, she had some like super exciting moments. Like, yeah, I, there was one one of the bosses. Like, I I died early, and it was all up to her, you know. And I was like, I said that I was like, it's all up to you. You can do this. She's like, I don't think we're gonna win, and she like pulled it off, you know. And they do that that slow mo at the end when you beat the boss, and she was like, oh my gosh, feel my heart. And I like, you know, I like felt her heart, her heart was just racing. It was like the most exciting moment of her life. So it was really cool. Is, is there any games that you've played or that you like, you're looking forward to playing with her? You're like, oh, when she's ready, we can play this together. Or is there anything that's, you know, that's maybe holds a spot for you that you're really excited to potentially play with her? I mean, you know, a lot of my favorite games are just, are not appropriate for her yet. Yeah. I'd love to play like Dark Souls with her or something. Mm hmm I think she'd have a t ton of fun like creating a character and I think it's there are a lot of great like female characters in in those games you know like I don't know Lady Marie of the Astral Clock Tower or whatever and I think she'd really get into it but um yeah I think it's going to be a while because yeah she is she is like 
um i think fairly sensitive to to scary stuff still uh you know even for even for her age so it's it's gonna be a while but yeah there i think there are a lot of great like um female-led games that are just not appropriate for her yet and <laughs> we just gotta take it one step at bayonetta time. you're gonna hold off on bayonetta for a while yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no she's familiar with bayonetta actually um through smash so she's she's gotten to play as bayonetta and smash but yeah not not ready for the uh core games yet <laughs> for, for all the parents or potential parents listening right now like is there how did you reach that subject with her what did you did you start her on a specific game and you're like hey let's start with this and see if she likes it or how did you approach that you know coming from the industry and, and having like a lot of fun and being such a big part of your life yeah i started her i feel like the very first game she played was maybe the um link between worlds yeah that was it on uh, i had a 2ds and i i let her mess around with that and she was just like a baby at that time and i i wasn't even sure she knew what was going on but she was just like pressing all these buttons and seemed like she was having a good time i'd say the the first like real game that she started playing was mario kart uh mario kart 8 uh yeah deluxe i think maybe i'm maybe we started on wii u or something like that and that was like a great place for her to start playing and initially she was she was nervous to play but i put her on just a time trial with like no other characters racing with her and it was really cool to watch her development and she started progressing really fast it was like very steady you could you, you know it would at first like she couldn't even get around the track and then she would like get around, do one lap and not be able to finish in time. There's actually like, I don't know, a 10 minute limit on the time trials where it just cuts you off at that point. And then eventually she was able to do, do that in under 10 minutes and get faster and faster. Then eventually she'd be able to play with me and her mom together, but no computer players like playing with the CPU was too scary. And then, you know, eventually she was playing with the CPU and us and we were like on the same team. And then eventually she got to the point where she could just play on her own against the CPU. And it was just, it was really cool. And yeah, Mario Kart, it, it's a game where you can play as the princesses, you know? Uh, and that, I think that really helped her get into it. And, you know, I think I, one thing I've just, I've realized is, yeah, for her, it's like, it's so important that she gets to like play as the princesses and things like that. And, you know, that was just something that came up organically. It's not like, you know, I didn't really like bring it up with her. It's just, we, we played video games together and she, you know, would, ask questions like why can't i play as the princess in you know super mario brothers or whatever or 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 zelda and then you know we just we started talking about it and i'd have to kind of explain like well you know these are like just traditions in in video games that kind of started with like the earliest games and but now they're starting to let you play as you know more and more princesses and and girls and stuff you just I, I, you know, I just had to explain, like, it can be hard to, I think, break out of these traditions. Because it is true when you're making a game, I think this is something I've, I've experienced as a developer also, is just like, you are very much kind of bound by traditions and what came before and, you know, what like your favorite games did. And you have to sort of mentally very, you know, think very hard about certain things to like break out of that, you know, like, you know, when I was a kid designing games, my, a lot, you know, all my games were just like, Oh, this is like Castlevania, but I'm like changing it a little bit. And you're not really thinking about like why Castlevania does certain things. It does. You just know, like, I like Castlevania. And so Castlevania did it this way. I'm going to do it like this way. I'm just going to like change the characters around or something like that. So, uh, you know, and games are so complex too. So it's like you, you know, for any particular game, it's really hard to put a hundred percent effort into like every aspect of the game. So there are going to be certain parts where you're just going to want to like do it the way other games do it so that you can put your energy into the parts that are like most important to you. 
What would be an example of that for your most recent game? Like with Spelunky 2, what are some traditions that you like followed and some that were really important to you to be like, I want to push here and I want to do something. So Sp Spelunky, with Spelunky 2, I really felt like I was able to, you know, think about everything kind of as deeply as I wanted because at that point, it it's like the third game in the Spelunky series. So, you know, a lot of the stuff that, I guess a lot of the stuff that I didn't have to think about were from the previous Spelunky games. And so um, I guess what I'm saying is like, you know, the inspiration came from previous Spelunky games as opposed to like other people's games that I had played and been inspired by. But for like Spelunky, let's say Spelunky Classic, right? Like the original freeware pixel art game, I was mostly focused on just the roguelike meets platformer design there right like that mix it was kind of a, it was a new thing at that time and so i had to spend like a lot of energy thinking about how to make that work so as a result you know like i wasn't thinking super hard about the theme about the story about things like that you know those i kind of just it's just like the first thing that popped into my head you know and the, the best ideas are never like the first thing that pops into your head <laughs> Because the first thing that pops in your head is always just like inspired by some other art that you've seen, right? Once you start getting to like the the second thing, the third thing that you think of, that's when you start getting into the better ideas. Those are the ideas that are deeper, that are more personal, that I think are more interesting and unique. But it's very hard to have like when you're working on a game to have every part of the game be like one of those ideas that's a few steps removed right and so you know that's a reason why like tropes exist basically is you know a lot of that is just because hey this part of the game was was the most important to me as a result like these other parts i kind of had to like go into tropey territory <laughs> You gotta... And it, you know, it also depends, I think, on your experience as a game developer. And obviously, the younger you are and the more inexperienced you are, the more you're going to kind of draw from that step one thought, right? And the more like, you know, you're going to be like, well, I'm, I want to, I really like Mega Man. I'm going to make like a Mega Man style game. And you're not, you're going to have a hard time thinking about how to do like a character select for your Mega Man style game that doesn't have that Brady Bunch like you know mm -hmm. grid to it you just won't be able to think like outside of that outside of your inspirations and so that's something that takes experience and i think that's also something you know with spelunky that i've it's a skill that i've kind of developed throughout the series and it's also gotten easier because the further i get into spelunky the more i can just draw from spelunky and what's unique about spelunky versus like the other games that that inspired spelunky you know i mean the basic ones right like roguelikes net hack i played a lot in net hack and um just i don't know mario for platformers right like every every mario every uh platformer game that i've played so and so so with spelunky too i feel like this is the most spelunky spelunky game that i've made you know it's the one where i've been able to think about it in kind of the most sort of unique and personal way so with Spelunky 2, you kind of, you had the foundation laid with Spelunky Classic. You know, you talk about like, you know, breaking away from these traditions for you. You said Classic was just kind of building the gameplay of a rogue like meets a platformer. Was there, just to get us to Spelunky 2 timeline, what kind of traditions did you feel like you, you spent your creative effort on, on the Spelunky HD that you were, since you didn't have to worry about that, did you focus on kind of a new tradition or what did you focus on with the second game? With the second game, I mean, a lot of that was just sort of getting the first game into that HD format. We were, Andy and I, Andy Hall and I, were doing a lot of work just, you know, trying to figure out how to make our first console game. Neither of us had ever made a console game before. I think Andy had worked with a company at one point that did make an Xbox game, but he was more of a... I think he was more of a junior just member of that company. It was like a summer job kind of thing. So we we're both going into it having very little experience to do this. And, you know, 
with Microsoft, like I, I was very confident with them. Like, yeah, we can, we can do this. <laughs> um it's a great story. Just, if, if you've never read the spelunky book and you're listening it's a great read because like you're saying this and i'm like like it was a lot that went into you just get like you're like yeah we can do this and you're in the background you're like how do we do this i, I did think we could <laughs> i just didn't know how at that point so it was a little bit of you know it was a little bit of bluster i think to just to get the project started and i figured we we'd find some way of doing it once we once we got started it was like an opportunity, you know, that I felt like we just couldn't couldn't pass up. I mean, when I first talked to Microsoft, Andy Hull was not even in the picture. He was a good friend of mine, but he had not offered to help me with doing the programming. And then even once he started working as a programmer, I don't think he knew that the extent to which he would be like the programmer. <laughs> and he, he did much more too. He was also did game design. He's a he's a wonderful artist in his own right. Also, and a lot of his a lot of his artwork I think made it into the final game. He came up with the golden but, um, monkey, right? He, that, was, that, that was based on a uh, a character of his from when we were kids in a previous we were game. In the click made? and play community, yeah. yeah. He he had a game called Golden Monkey Strike. So, the Golden Monkey, Carl the Cyclops, the orange character, and the the blue bear are all directly inspired by him a lot of people have asked like where's the blue bear in spelunky 2 and it's he's not a playable character because andy was not working on spelunky 2 in the same in the same way so so take that yeah, andy. i mean just joking. no you, i mean he you saw he's in the <laughs> he's in the credits, in the credits. Yeah. yeah 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 but uh, that's why we didn't bring him back as a playable character but still like honored him in the credits all right so um, to, so to wrap up like the tradition segment so and cut me off if i'm wrong spelunky classic you're like okay how does this game work spelunky hd you're like let's just get this to the next kind of platform hd so then spelunky 2 you don't have to worry about that right you kind of have the foundation so what did you worry about or where did you focus your creative energy for spelunky 2 with Spelunky 2, I think it was mostly just about putting in the work because I had this idea of what I wanted it to be from the beginning. And I think, you know, we ended up staying pretty close to that idea, to that initial vision of it. So mostly it was I just the effort of, I think, making it come to life, like the actual effort of the programming, doing the art and things like that. Um and you know, I think there was, I think there was a lot of work just like figuring out what things to pull out of Spelunky one, and where to put it in Spelunky two. So for Spelunky two, I definitely there was like no, there's nothing from Spelunky one that I felt like couldn't return um, necessarily in Spelunky two. So like I had I had no qualms about like bringing things back, but I wanted to put them in a new context in Spelunky 2 and, you know, give them more features and things like that. You know, like the caveman, I think, is a perfect example of just a character from Spelunky 1 where I knew this caveman was going to come back. It's just like, in what context is this caveman going to come back? Right. <laughs> so like, but I, I, there was, I didn't want to change anything to just for the sake of changing it. I think that was a big, that was a key element of the design of Spelunky 2. Before we kind of get into the lore type stuff, you said you had a vision early on from Spelunky 2 for what you wanted that to be. How would you describe that to someone that's, that wants, like, what was your initial vision for Spelunky 2? What did you want to have happen? Well, one thing I thought about was just what does a sequel mean to me? And to me, it is it is just like a huge expansion of previous games so i i knew that we weren't going to change anything core about spelunky one and part of the reason why i wanted to do spelunky two was because since spelunky one had come out like there has been an explosion of roguelike games right but i s still felt like not a lot of them were really doing what spelunky one did which you know i think that's cool i think that speaks to just how big this genre is well, you're right, very right. humble. Like you set the bar so, and you set the bar so high with with the platforming roguelike like with Spelunky. And and I know you've heard this a lot. And and I don't think, you know, for you to get this praise, you know, I'm sure it's it's an interesting thing to deal with. But you set the bar so high, I would imagine other people look at that and be like, how do you 
How do you beat that? You know, how do you beat that? So I, I just wanted to interject because you're so humble. But so you set this you set this bar. But anyways, go ahead. I, I appreciate I appreciate it. I think honestly, though, I think it's just that other developers had other things that they wanted to do with it. I think Spelunky did sort of prove that, hey, roguelike is kind of like it's kind of like rpg like you can have roguelike elements in the same way you can just have rpg elements in pretty much every game right like if you want to add rpg elements to your game you just you add some leveling you add experience and things like that and you've got rpg elements and roguelikes you can with roguelikes you can just you can add some random level generation you can add some permadeath and Ooh. stuff and you've got roguelike elements in your game it's, Were you surprised? it's a similarly broad like concept that you can apply to all kinds of stuff and that's that's what i think spelunky show but i think the reason why there's so many different roguelike games now is just like yeah everyone had their own opinion and own idea of what they wanted to do with it so were you surprised that there another you don't want to call it spelunky clone but another like something in the same you could even put in the same silo as spelunky because i feel i mean there really wasn't not to that extent. Yeah, you know, I mean, one of the things that I think a lot of the roguelikes did that Spelunky doesn't do is they did start adding the, like, very immediately started adding, like, progression systems in between runs, you know, where your character can actually get stronger just just by doing runs, like, no matter no matter what you do, like, you'll, you'll kind of, it'll get a little easier over time. And so, you know, that was one area where I, I felt like, Hey, we can with Spelunky too, if we just kind of keep that aspect of keeping it very run based from Spelunky one, like it'll still be pretty unique. I think in this new landscape of roguelikes, did you ever consider changing that at all? Or was it always I, this? I didn't. Cause to me, that is so core to Spelunky. And the thing is, I know it's one of those things where I, I know it actually kind of hurts the sort of mainstream acceptability of Spelunky because people just, they, they like that kind of progress. And I think for certain types of games, like I really like it too, you know, like it just, it feels good. If it, maybe more importantly, it feels bad, I think, to <laughs> hit that wall where it just feels like you're not improving at a game, right? Like I've done so many runs and i just can't get out of the first area of the game like it feels bad and you know my hope is always that well if you persevere over that wall then it's going to feel extra good right because <laughs> you know you did it like all by yourself and you know that you learned a lot about the game um and you know it's a that's an aspect of like old games that i that i do like like a lot of those games are just kind of cheap which sucks like cheap deaths and stuff like that. But I do like that when you get like really good at the game and you beat it, like you just, you just did it all yourself pretty much. Like the game did not help you per se. Yeah. Um, and so that was, you know, that's like a, a concept that I think is very, very much in like, uh, it's very much unique to Spelunky. And I think it's actually, uh, something that's pretty unique to just like the traditional roguelikes. I think Spelunky of action roguelikes, I feel like Spelunky takes, I don't want to say the most because I don't know about like all the games out there, but it certainly takes, I think, a lot from traditional roguelikes compared to other action roguelikes these days. And I'm still like very much inspired by traditional roguelikes, even though I don't really play them like a ton. I still spent a lot of time like reading about them and studying them. And I think there's a lot that we can still learn from them. So when you, you talk about your vision for Spelunky 2, you said keeping things kind of the core Spelunky, Spelunky, not changing anything in terms of what people or what the gameplay loop is to be expected. So what else did you, in, the, in that initial vision, which by the way, when was that? When did you say, hey, I'm ready to do another sequel, roughly? It was like right around when I was writing the book about Spelunky because I was spending a lot of time thinking about Spelunky while I was writing it. I, you know, I'd already had like ideas of maybe doing a sequel, but I think they really solidified while I was working on the book because to write the book, I had to go back and 
just read all of our old emails about the game and stuff. I don't, I don't have a great memory about just the game development, you know, the game development that I've, that I've been a part of. Um, I'm not like John Romero. Like I'm always just so impressed with John Romero because he will just like recall the exact day that he thought of some idea. And he always mentions like every mission of doom by its exact name, like, you know, E seven M M three or something like that. And I just would not ever be able to do that. <laughs> so, uh, but for context, but yeah, what to answer your question? Yeah. Well, when I was working on the book, which was, yeah, like five years ago or something like that is when I started thinking, okay, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm thinking so much about Spelunky 1, and that, of course, is just making me think about what I would like to do with Spelunky more and, you know, how a sequel could actually make sense in this context. And so so as you're doing that, as you're writing, you're like, okay, hey, look, here's some ideas or, or here's why I'd want to take the sequel. What else was really important to you in that vision in creating this sequel? So I just felt like with, Spelunky's characters and its mechanics and just on a technical level there was just so much more we could do in terms of you know just expanding on that I think very simply just expanding on that so if you think about what we did with Spelunky 1 it's like kind of this circle you know I just felt like we could take it further and I didn't know where that boundary was but you know I had an idea of things that we could we could start with, right? What well, what were some of those um, early ideas that you're like, this is an early thing that I think would work? Well, very early on, actually, I had a call with Andy Hull, and he's the one who suggested adding the second layer in the background because I was I was telling him, hey, I want the sequel. And I just wanted to know what he thought about that because he was such a big part of Spelunky 1. And I, you know, and, and I think in a way, I kind of wanted to get his blessing on doing the sequel, even though I, I was pretty sure he wanted to work on his own projects at that point and wouldn't be a part. So I kind of wanted to just get his thoughts <laughs> and also, yeah, kind of kind of get his blessing to to work on it. Did with, you ask or, or was it kind of just you could tell in the tone of voice? Like, did you flat out ask him or no? I think I just asked him, like, what do you think? I don't think it was like a like a, you know, godfather, yeah. like. Like asking for his for his uh, approval, kind of thing. Um, you know, I kind of figured he he would. I I didn't. I wasn't expecting that he'd be like, no, you can't do it without <laughs> me. And also, I'm going to be busy for like you know the next the next however many years. So, yeah, come at me, come at me then with with your idea. <laughs> um, no, but he came up with the, uh, the the second layer thing. Uh, you know, I knew that I I did want to do online multiplayer for Splunky too because it was a it was a feature that was asked for a lot. You know, I knew that Blit was going to be the only the only partner that could really make some of that step, make you know some of that stuff happen, like technically. Because, yeah, I think that and like the you know the liquid physics it w- was an early thing. A lot of the, a lot of the major stuff. Um, I think branching paths also. You know, and th- there's some really obvious stuff like you know you want to make the chain just even longer and kind of more secretive and mysterious um you know i knew i wanted to uh like approach the art style from a from a different way i as a visual artist i approach all of my games from like a very visual standpoint and i knew i wanted to like take another crack at that because i was still very much learning with spelunky one i mean you're always learning but like with spelunky one it was i had to do like a lot of experimenting um, and I felt like, you know, I hadn't quite gotten the art style where, where I wanted it to, but other than that, it was just like, I think more generally thinking we have all of these elements in place with Spelunky one, how do we just make them bigger, better, more interesting? You know, it's, it's, I think it's as simple as stuff like you have the crush traps in the temple in Spelunky one. What if we just had like a really big version of that? You know, it's not like it's not super heady, like deep philosophical stuff, but that does change the game. And especially with a game like Spelunky, you put all that stuff together and these seemingly small changes like really add up to something bigger. So in a lot of ways, it's just 
as simple as just making like a bigger version of Spelunky and just like pushing everything to its limit. And I think that comes out as sometimes just like literally making stuff bigger, you know, <laughs> like literally <laughs> just making like a bigger trap or like a crazier version of an existing trap. Do you have a, I know it was probably hard to pick out, but do you have a, if you had to pick a favorite of something you made bigger, like physically bigger from Spelunky 1 to Sp or Spelunky HD to Spelunky 2, is there anything there like this? This was kind of my baby. I'm really excited well, I love about the this. idea very early on of Olmec returning just like in the middle of the game and then just being like a crazy boss fight. I like the idea of it starting off exactly as it did in Spelunky one so that people would be like, you know, hey, what's going on? This is did I reach the end of the game? And also, you know, Derek, you lazy bum, like you're just <laughs> like reusing Olmec from Spelunky one and then having it change on people. I really like that. The idea, I think, of just putting stuff from Spelunky 1 in Spelunky 2 in a new context and having that really change how you feel about it and how you interact with it, is uh, that was really cool to me. And I, I just loved the, having the chance to do that, and I, which is one of the reasons why I was so excited to do a sequel. And also, at that time, like indie game developers weren't doing a ton of sequels. Not so much. It was like just starting yeah. to happen, right? Like, I think... You know, there's like Hotline Miami too and stuff, but indies were kind of known for just making one game and then just making like a completely different game in another genre. Um, and so I was I was really interested in seeing like what would a sequel be like, just building on an existing concept and just building on existing success too with that concept. To me, that that seemed fun. Because Splunky 1 was sort of like a test for that because it wasn't a sequel per se, but it was like a remake of Splunky Classic. And so I working on Splunky 1, I saw how fun it was to basically get to do like a fan game of your own game, <laughs> you know? And that, I think working on a sequel is kind of like that. It's, it's uh, you know, we were talking before about you know, being inspired by other games and stuff. And I think, I think you do always have to look out for being like, you know, too inspired. Like what is, what is kind of unique and personal to me and what is sort of coming from my background of playing, playing other games with, with Spelunky too, it was great. Cause it's like, I can just, I'm, I'm just going to be like inspired mostly by, my previous work and so it was really cool to just i think kind of be completely free to take from spelunky one and then repurpose reimagine and add new things also and just like completely change it up but it's really cool to have that blueprint of spelunky it, one to work with if, if you'll allow me the comparison it's like you know you're like george lucas you have the star wars universe already built and you can take pieces of that but I, I do want to, because I read this in a, in a really recent interview you just did, you said that Spelunky 2, like thematically for you, not, your games don't really reflect like, oh, this my, it's my life experience in this game. Like this is, I'm really, you know, guy Spelunky trying to do this. But you said like there's a, a theme throughout this one about family and community and, and that's woven throughout this game. Is there a reason you, you felt or why you wanted to do that with Spelunky too? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you can kind of see like my progression as, as a person from Spelunky Classic to Spelunky 2. I think Spelunky Classic, I see that as just an exploration of just mechanics, just being like really interested in the mechanics of games and systems and how they interact and things like that. And then... With Spelunky 1 on Xbox 360, I think very much it was about like mastery and the joy of being really good at something. Um, and I feel like getting good at anything is just, it just improves your life and makes you a better person. You know, I think there's, I think there's, you know, criticism of, of games from people who are not familiar with games that, Hey, you know, you're just like 
wasting your time like you just you got really good at this game how does that apply to quote unquote real life but you just by getting good at anything even if it's a in a virtual world and these are virtual skills they it just i think it changes the, the way you look at life i think it changes the way you think about things and it helps you get good at other things because the the discipline it takes to get good at playing a video game can easily apply to making a video game or doing anything else. Um, and also it just feels good. And I think, I, I think we should accept that just feeling good is like a great part of life. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, just entertainment or whatever, just art. It just, that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so Spelunky one on Xbox, I think was very much about, mastery getting good at something and i think i was thinking about that a lot working on the game andy and i were working hard uh you know andy eric and i eric did the the music for spelunky one and yeah you know we were like a trio we were at a point i think in all of our careers where we were young and we we're still like feeling things out and trying to get better at our craft and I think that really came out in Spelunky 1, which, you know, to me, I see as a less refined game than Spelunky 2, but also, like, I see the energy that we, all three of us, put into it as, like, these young people. Um, and then with Spelunky 2, well, between Spelunky 1 and Spelunky 2, you know, I got married, I had a kid, and... Uh, Spelunky one was did well, which is great, and it, it was like another big turning point in my life. And I think it it changed the way I, I saw things again. And so now Spelunky two I, is a to me it's a more mature video game that also reflects that I'm interested in things other than game mechanics, game systems, and just like getting really good at my work. You know, now I have a family and, you know, I'm seeing like how important that is, how important it is to have friends. I, you know, the Spelunky community, I think, which came up after Spelunky 1 came came out. And I, you know, I saw how important uh, that was, you know, just how cool that was, but also like how important they were in the success of the game and and i think in helping people get into spelunky that wouldn't otherwise get into it and so that that's one of the reasons why spelunky 2 has like its own little community in it uh and you know i think i'm always you know there's this concept of like the the lonely game where you're just like the lone hero and basically every other character is just and it is just kind of off to the side and you have to kind of like carry all this weight on your shoulders. I think with Splunky too, like I I wanted to put forth the idea that, you know, that's, that is never the case. And also I just wanted people to like, not feel lonely playing Splunky too, even if they're playing a single player, right? Like there are other characters in this world that do care about you and that also have their own lives and business. I think the quest characters are are a big part of that too. Just making the world feel more alive, more like a bre- living, breathing place. Are you- so that's kind of like, yeah. I think that's that's like the big sort of emotional arc of, of Spelunky, <laughs> if you want to call it that. And yeah, I, I, there's there's me in like all of my games. I just tend not to make games that are like very directly thematically tied to my life. You know, so it's just it's not a game about like. Derek, you, the family man, right? But I, that comes out in a game about exploring caves anyways. And for you, when you... So there are, you know, a lot of new characters in the game. Are, when you make those decisions to put new characters in the game, and, and I think I don't want to speak for you, but I remember seeing some, like, ridiculous feedback about the game and character selection, but there's a lot of female characters you can pick in the game. I mean, is that not directly homage to your daughter, but to be like, hey, look, here's an example of a game where there's not just one or two girls you can play. Yeah, I, you know, I was already on that, I think the road of <laughs> thinking about that stuff. It's like I said, you, it's hard to think about everything 
with the same amount of energy when you're working on a game. So with Spelunky One, uh, Spelunky Classic, sorry, I was just thinking mostly about the mechanics, you know, and so like I I took a lot of inspiration from like adventure movies and Indiana Jones and you know adventure video games like cave exploration video games and stuff like that. And I just, you know, I didn't put a lot of thought into the characters, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> and so it's interesting, I think, having to kind of deal with that thoughtlessness as the as the game progressed, right? And you know, you I mean you can very clearly see that in the evolution of the damsel, right? From being like barely a character to well, you now you have a choice of who you want to save to hey, the damsel is now. Demi Von Diamonds, you can play as her and, and, and you're rescuing pets. So I was already kind of like on my way to thinking harder about this stuff. And then, yeah, you have a kid and that just, it seems to just drive home like every every point you've been already thinking about. And so then it was just really obvious. And I, I just, I thought to myself like, yeah, we did have some really cool playable female characters in Spelunky 1, but why not like exactly half, like exactly 50%, you know, the world is exactly 50% uh, like women, right? Women and girls. And so why not, why not do that? You know, it, it and you just, it, 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 it's so obvious after you realize it and it is like more than obvious when you have, yeah, women in your life, right? And so, um, and I think especially especially with kids because you put you have to put yourselves in in your kids' shoes and they're also I think just blank when they start out and like I was saying before I, I saw how important it was for my daughter that she was able to play as a girl in like every single game like every single game she'd ask like you know like. Can you play as her? Can you play as her? Can you play as her? Right? And it's like, I didn't say, I didn't bring that topic up at all. It's just, she cares. And, and I think, uh, you know, for me, I realized like, yeah, well, that's not something I asked when I was a kid because I was like completely full on characters. You know what I mean? Although, you know, I think as I got older, I was like, hey, why why aren't there more like Asian characters in this game? (laughs) People, I think people, it just makes people feel good I think, to see themselves in games. And it's just, it, it, as a developer, when you realize that, it's, it, you know, you want to make p- people feel good in those ways. Like, the ways I want to make people feel bad are just like <laughs> getting killed by a spider trap. <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to make them feel bad because they, they just cannot find a character that even like remotely um, looks like them. Are, are there, so are there it's any... just not a way that I want to make people <laughs> feel bad. And the game is also perfect for having lots of very diverse characters. And it was fun. And it, it and it ends up thinking about it in that way, ends up making the game better because you just start thinking about the characters, period, uh, more than you would originally. So, you know, now, now I'm thinking a little bit more about um, the... Uh, the, the representation of the characters and I'm starting to think more just about them as, as people and their backstories and stuff and like what I want to put in the, in the journal and things like that. And it makes it more interesting. And then I've got the interesting challenge of, yeah, all these characters that I kind of created for the previous games where I didn't put as much thought into them. And now they, you know, I want to bring a lot of them back and give them their own backstories and make it fit, fit together. And it's, it ends up being just, I think a very interesting, fun, fun problem. How and a lot of the stories I've heard, sorry, are yeah. just from parents playing the game with their kids. And in particular, I've heard like a lot of stories of parents playing with their daughters and they're, you know, they're playing as Princess Aaron. Like people specifically mentioned that, like she's playing as the princess and, and I'm just like, that's awesome. You know, she's like, she has a character and she's going to like, love video games that much more because of it you know so it's cool i feel like it's a great opportunity to it's a win-win situation really because your your character design gets better you bring the game to more people 
and you, you know you make them you make them happier so, so so now a kid who's like a blank slate of games is going to play spelunky 2 they're going to be excited about the character and then they're going to say why does the game designer hate me so much and, and why does he hurt me so much no. uh, <laughs> they're like mommy why does derek hurt, hate us so much why did why did you bring this upon us well I'm, I'm hoping that what they'll learn is a good lesson about perseverance and failure <laughs> i will say i i see a lot of parallels between parenting and game design you know i can't help it like i'm a game designer and when i when i look at my I, my daughter in a way she's like the biggest player you know for me to to kind of game design for right because i'm like for her i'm like in some ways designing like the game of life for her you know well even just and, even just the quip that you gave us about playing mario kart you're like okay you play mario kart by yourself now let me just add in one variable you know like that's got to be cool and rewarding for you well it's like with kids you gotta you have to challenge them in the same way you have to challenge players right but you know you want them to you want them to learn and eventually become independent and i think that's kind of a big part of my just natural game philosophy also is i want players to be very independent and you know in the in the end i want them to be independent and to me that means not always holding their hand through all the challenges of playing the game and i think it's the same with life too right like you you want to provide like enough challenge and give kids like enough enough independence that eventually that they can you know go on and, and play some some hard games without you right like get that get that one cc on your own you know? <laughs> <laughs> get that one cc on life we're gonna play co-op for a while but like at some point you gotta you gotta take the training wheels off and then get that one cc yourself and in, you know enjoy the process of it too <laughs> So, so to circle back from one CC back to the characters in the game, are there any characters in the game that are on the cutting room floor that didn't make the cut? And what was your process to be like, hey, this is who needs to be in the game? You know, part of it was kind of a popularity contest, and I, I did want characters who it seemed like players really enjoyed from Spelunky 1 to come back. Um, of course, you know, you end up cutting some characters and you realize that there are a ton of people that love that character, <laughs> right? Like as soon as the character's gone, that's when, Derek. yeah, that's when all of the, um, the, the like lime characters, they come out of the woodwork and they're like, what? Do you do? So, yeah, uh, it, it, so it's difficult. I think it's, um, it's a balancing act of wanting to include some new characters, realizing I, I probably didn't have it in me to do, more than 20 characters for Spelunky 2 because it's by far for me like the most intensive part of the game like art wise at least is just doing the animations for all those characters um and I, I did try hard to like set up a system of making it as easy as possible I've got this like huge photoshop file with all the characters in it but it's it's just like a really it's a really draining task to do all those animations for them. And I, I, you know, I wanted to like give them a little more personality, like give them more, uh, give them like their unique ropes and, you know, a little bit more of like a unique look. Like, you know, in Spelunky 1, the characters are much more like templated where just their outfits and stuff are a little more similar. So for Spelunky 2, you know, like Coco has the, lemur on her head and stuff there's just and those just take like extra work to add those little details that that aren't the same from character to character so it's it's a balancing act and you always know that you're gonna make some people a little bit unhappy but you, well, you gotta do it you well, know was there any part of you in this process thinking okay hey look this is what i want him to look like did you ever consider having someone else do that or is that never an option for you you wanted to to do it for me, it was a big step just hiring <laughs> Justin to work with us to do the character art. Yeah. Like the character illustrations, I should say. Um, because I'd never worked with an artist in that capacity before. Like with Andy, he did do a lot of the art, but 
you know, a lot of it was kind of UI stuff. And I think, honestly, he intended it mostly as a placeholder when he put it in. And I would kind of like touch it up. But, you know, a lot of his placeholder art, for Andy, he's just such an exacting person that a lot of his placeholder art was just, it was just straight up good enough. He just likes to look, like when he's working on a game, like he just likes it to look nice. Like at any point of the development, like he wants it to look nice while he's working on it. So he would just, if he needed like a UI element, he had to program it in. I was busy doing something else. He would just paint it himself and, and pop it in. So I've just never worked with like an artist where they had the explicit job of like making extra artwork, like final artwork that was going to go into the game in the same way as Justin. So that was kind of like my step toward that. And it worked out really well. I was, I, I wondered if it would feel too strange or something to see someone else's artwork in there. But I think, I think our styles mesh pretty well. And, and in the end, I, it's, it's just awesome. Like I love seeing Justin's art everywhere, you know, like, like his art, his painting of, of, of Anna and of the bats and the snakes, like on the title screen are in like all of our key art, our game icons and stuff like that. Um, and it's great. And I, you know, we couldn't have finished the game when we did without him because it's a ton of work. Why was that hard for you to make that decision or be okay with that decision to bring on an artist or work with another artist? I've just always approached my games from like a very visual standpoint. Drawing was like my first love. Um, you know, like the first games that I designed were just like on paper when I was a kid. And so it's it's very hard for me to kind of like separate the game from the visual aspect of it because I see it in my head in like a visual way. And, you know, I just I want to do the art for it. And it's just it's just a part of game development also that I like really enjoy, too. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be it'd be difficult for me to make a game where I'm just doing design and, and directing artists because I would just so want to like go in and do some art myself. You know, not because anyone is doing like a worse job than me. It's just like I, I just really love drawing. So, yeah. well, that's that's funny. On your Instagram, I saw you did like Inktober. You did you know a, a new, uh, I think it was Goblin drawing every day. And then I always look at them, and then it took me a minute because you there would always be two posts, or most of the time there'd be two posts. I'd be like, the art's very different. And then it finally clicked that you weren't the only person that was doing the art on your Instagram posts. Did you, you brought that up with your daughter to do like the challenge? Yeah, we've been doing Inktober for quite a few years now. Is it three? It might even be four. So she started doing Inktober with me very early on. Um, and she's awesome at it. Kids are just, because the reason why Inktober is so hard for adults is because you're like trying to, you know, like make it look quote unquote, good enough to put on Twitter or something. And everyone wants to have like a really cool, like nifty theme, like across the entire month that they stick with. Uh, for, for my daughter, she just draws whatever she wants every day. And she, and she also loves the fact that she always finishes before me. She's <laughs> like, I'm, I'm done. Oh, you're, you're slower than me. Aren't you? <laughs> I'm like, yes, I am. Um, but it, it's cool to see how laid back she is about that and how laid back kids are about it in general. And it's, it's helped me be a little more laid back too and a little bit less of a perfectionist with Inktober. I, I wanted to do it with her just for fun, but I do think Inktober is just, it's a great way to practice finishing stuff and being a little less perfectionist because it's actually much harder than it looks. And you see a lot of people start and they get a few days in and they have to stop. And part of it, I think, is that perfectionism, especially because you have to, you know, part of the challenge is to post on Twitter uh, and stuff. So if you, you know, if you're having trouble, I think finishing like your projects, I tell game developers, like, you know, it's not game development, but it's it's a good exercise to try. It's only a month long. 
and you will see every you will get the basic feeling of every part of game development you'll get that initial like giddy excitement of yay i'm starting a game and the first couple of days you're like this is so awesome this is great this is so fun and then very quickly you're like oh man okay i'm starting to get a little tired of doing this and like oh you know like when i started this inktober thing i kind of thought i would just have like a couple free hours every day to do it but <laughs> it turns out like you know today i i woke up and I just didn't feel so great and that oh now I'm like actually I've, I've got to like travel today or, or whatever um you know like a lot of our Inktobers not now obviously but like in previous years we just we had stuff we had to like travel to during the month and would just be doing our Inktobers on the road right so you realize like midway through one okay this is actually kind of a, a slog it's a like kind of a grind and also real life is intruding in a way that I just did not expect it to when I started the project. And just like with Inktober in the middle of a video game project, like that's when you want to stop or that's when other game ideas start to pop up in your head and they sound more exciting because you're not in the middle of them. They're just like potential ideas and you've got to have that discipline to kind of push through and finish it off. And then, yeah, by the end of October, like I'm exhausted, you know, and I'm just like barely getting it done, but I'm happy that I finished it because that's like one more thing that I finished. That's a little more experience I have finishing something. Is there anything so, you've done discipline wise that has helped you? Like someone's listening, being like, all right, hey, I need to finish this, but I keep dropping off. Is there anything that you specifically done over the years that have helped you to kind of hone that discipline? You know, I think the biggest thing is just in a general sense, not thinking about every project as its own individual separate thing, but as part of your life and part of a long string of things you're going to do. So thinking it as thinking about it as a smaller part of that whole, I think you're able to be a little more okay with some of the imperfections of it. And it's very difficult when you're starting out, like making your first game, especially if it if you're starting out and you're making kind of like a bigger, more like a commercial game or something like that. I was fortunate that I kind of got my start making games in the click and play community where we were a bunch of kids and we were using click and play. And, you know, there was like a little bit of pressure from like other the other young people in this community to finish your game. But we were also like raw material at that point, And we didn't have all the pressures of, you know, making a game that's as good as like the commercial triple a games that we were playing at the time. We were just a bunch of kids making games for a bunch of kids. And so as a result, like I actually finished like a bunch of small games at that time and was able to see the entire development through from beginning to end just on a small scale so that's what inktober feels like too it's just like you get all the same feelings just within the span of a month and it's a it's a less intense investment of your time so i think getting that practice of finishing smaller things it's like it gives you the exact same feelings as a bigger one you know it's just like if you're eventually going to run like an ultra marathons right like First, just start by running a mile and getting like good and consistent at doing that and then slowly get bigger and bigger. Um, and then just more generally see it as, see each project as a smaller part of like all the projects you're going to work on. I think a lot of people, a lot of game developers, if you're like an indie developer and you're like making a game, it's, they feel like this is my, this is like my one shot and I got to make this game perfect and they end up putting a lot of work i think in the final years of the project that honestly are are giving them marginal returns in terms of like how successful the game is going to eventually be because you know what happens is when you start you don't know like which ideas of yours that you like you know you don't know how many other people are going to also like them and if it's your job like it it does matter how many 
people are gonna you know enjoy and your game and want to and want to buy it and not only that like you know people are looking at your game based on i think a lot of superficial stuff like just screenshots and and stuff like that and you kind of have to learn over time like how to make a successful game right it's just it's just like where where is that that overlap of the games i like and the games that other people like where does that overlap the most so for your first few games like you just you just need to kind of like get those games out and see how what people think so you can kind of learn that stuff but i think what happens is people game development is so takes so long and you put so much effort into it that it just feels like well i've already spent like a couple years on this i i may as well like spend an another couple more years just polishing the heck out of this game not realizing that those like next two years really didn't have a huge effect on their sales in the end and that that was time that they could have spent maybe exploring like another idea you know so earlier you brought up this feedback and maybe that's time where like you could put a game out and get the feedback and change it i want to get into like a little bit more specific about Spelunky 2 as we kind of wrap things up here. It, yeah. You, you talked about like when you released the trailer, the very first trailer, and you talked mm -hmm. about this feeling of, you know, exuberance and all this stuff. What was some of the, the tougher feedback you remember? Do you remember getting tough feedback regarding anything on the trailer or when the game was released that made you think a little bit or at least think and then get rid of it or think and act on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, the I think the first like gameplay trailer, you know, there was a lot of feedback about the art just looking flat. Um and yeah, I think I, I think that was true. The art had not there was still like quite a lot of work to be done on the art um at that point. And also I think there's a big difference playing the game full screen on your monitor versus like looking at it on in a tiny thumbnail on Twitter. <laughs> and so I was like, yeah, the compression is rough on on the game right now. But you know, I I put the we put the trailer out knowing that it wasn't the game wasn't like done yet and it wasn't perfect. I think um as an indie developer, you you're not always afforded the chance of putting out like a trailer that like only shows off the game in a super <laughs> nice way. But part of the reason why I put trailers out is not just to like market the game to people, but it's also to get feedback. It's another indie thing. You just, you, all these things you do as an indie developer, they have multiple purposes. So I'm putting the trailer out to get that feedback and see what people think and then make adjustments. And so right after that trailer came out, I definitely started putting um, like there's definitely a, like a period right after the trailer came out where I just was working on artwork a lot. Did you take any of that feedback personal or are you, have, are you at a point now where you're like, Hey, I have my armor up. I can take this for what it is. Cause I know yeah, it, now, yeah. now my, yeah, now my armor is, is definitely up. I mean, in general, like I'm, I, you know, I just really try not to take that kind of stuff personally either. I mean, from eh, I don't know. We're all we're all internet users, and I think we're hopefully most of us, you know, are trying to be kind. But when when you think like nobody's watching, you see a trailer, like you just you 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 say what you think about it, right? Like I I I get that, and I I, I think the other thing is is just that, um, you know, I I think I kind of lost my train of thought. Oh, yes, I remember what I was going to say. So the other thing is that as when you're just starting out, you know how bad it feels to be ignored as as an artist. So you know, I think I think in the end that's kind of w the worst thing is just to put out a trailer and nobody comments, right? And so for me, if I see a lot of people comment and a lot of them are like Oh, the art style looks so flat. Like I wish it looked like Splunky One. Um, I'd much rather they say that than than not care about the game. So that's something you know I I definitely think about, which which helps. 
and and then the other thing is just you you have to be to make use of the feedback you have to be a little thick skinned to just be, be able to evaluate it uh objectively and you know i, I always get defensive initially <laughs> you know like <laughs> with with any kind of feedback and I, you know I, including just like uh you know feedback from from people i'm working with it's just the nature of things right like you put out an idea and you're like this is a great idea you get challenged on it and you're like what are you talk no you're wrong you're wrong um <laughs> I can't see you saying that I haven't had this conversation, but maybe it's, it's a little different. No, no, no. I, I, I definitely pop off and, uh, <laughs> you know, when I'm reading comments and stuff, you know, just like you, you know, when you're like, <laughs> is I'm there, like, is there any comments? I mean, not that you can laugh. Are there any comments that you remember be like, is this for real about Spelunky too? Um, I mean, I think even with the, the art style stuff where I, I agree that there was a grain of truth. It looked, it, it did look too flat. And you, you see things differently once the game is public in any form. It's the strangest thing, but it's seeing your game like in a trailer, even seeing, see, even seeing the trailer like before it's published to YouTube, like it just looks different than once it's actually published to YouTube. Or it's like, even just like a tweet, right? You're like, yeah, this tweet looks great. And then you put it out. <laughs> And it's and as soon as it goes live and like you get that first like or whatever on it, you're like, oh my God, like why did I say that that way? It's this weird thing about things being published where it's like it's like it's in a different font or something. All of a sudden you just like read it in a completely different way. Um But you know, even when the trailer first came out, I thought it was funny because you know, people were saying like, I've, I love the art from Spelunky 1. Why can't it just look like that? And it, that's exactly what people said about Spelunky 1. They're like, <laughs> I like the way Spelunky Classic looked. Why can't it look like that? And it's you, you do realize that people, they just, they do like what they're used to also. So it's difficult because you, you get feedback and there is truth to crit the criticism but then at the same time you know there's a little bit of like well i just don't like it because it's new mixed in there and so you kind of have to see like well how much of what they're saying is is true and should be should be implemented and that's a difficult part of of taking feedback i think as a game developer as an artist because people do generally like what they're comfortable with and they can only sort of tolerate like a certain amount of newness and things i mean think about like wind waker right remember mm -hmm. yeah that's when wind waker it was a complete came out shift and it's just so funny now everyone's like it, it stands up to the, <laughs> the test of time like it's so iconic well, um well it's like and then if you did the artwork from spelunky one and spelunky two people are like oh he didn't change anything like it, it looks exactly the same yeah yeah, yeah 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 exactly so it's there, there was definitely like a lot of truth to the idea of it looking flat. And I, I, I looked at the comparisons and stuff and I, I agreed. And part of that was just, we're at a point in development where I could not afford to spend all my time just polishing the art. Like we had to move forward on other parts of the game. Cause with game development, like for me, it's, it's very important that I'm not just working on one thing or that our team's not working on one thing all the time like you these things kind of have to move up together unfortunately that means with a trailer like we can't just you know put out like a very small snapshot of the game where the art is just like incredible and then everything else like outside of the trailer is just complete jank <laughs> you know like at that point the the game like everything was kind of at the at the same level because i, I think that's required to eventually like finish a game and have everything everything release at the same level too you know like you want you want all parts of the game to to work together well all right derek well as we wrap stuff up if you're open to it i'd like to do like a speed round and this is going to be some like spelunky 2 specific we like we we got the guy in the chair we don't want the, oh, no. we don't we want the mystery we, we want we want the hard answers 
info from me that <laughs> I'm not ready to give out just by like putting me in the hot seat. But and you know, if you don't want to answer, that's fine. Also from the live chat, if you guys have questions, I've I've got a few, but uh first and foremost, this is a specific question about Waddler. Does Waddler move okay. around or does the world move around Waddler in your mind? And you're the one that designed it. So we have different ideas about what Waddler actually does. Okay. Like, you know, on the team. For me personally, you know, Waddler is a slime. So he just like moves through small crevices like in the level. That's why I made him a slime so that it can explain like how he gets from place to place, but also that's how he carries the items too. Yeah. All right. That's the, that's good. Deep lore. These are, these are going to be easy. That's, that's easy. So the eggplant, is there, I know it's, there's some history behind it. Why would the selection of the vegetable of the eggplant versus like broccoli or cucumber? Why eggplant? Uh, it's just a mysterious seeming fruit. Did you play kid Icarus as a kid? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I did also. It's it's a bit of a nod to Kid Icarus, and it's appeared in a lot of old Japanese games. I think it's also in like, well, I was going to say Prince's Tomato in the Salad Kingdom, but that has all fruits and vegetables, <laughs> doesn't it? I don't know. It seems like it's come up in other places. I think like Ice Climber, it, it mm -hmm. kind of is a prominent character in that also or something. I don't know. It just, it stuck out in my head. And here's a here's a um, interesting fun fact for you while we're talking about eggplants is that when uh Splunky one came out i did not like the taste of eggplants <laughs> now i do now i'm actually a big fan of of eggplants and uh you know like i love like baba ganoush and stuff <laughs> i like it when, you know when i eat eggplant cooked and not like mashed up uh, i like it a little firmer that's what i learned <laughs> in the past i was eating eggplant too too soft too soggy are you do you like eggplant parmesan? Have you ever had eggplant parmesan? Is it just like parmesan cheese? I think I have. It's like a it. chicken parm, but instead of chicken, it's like it's like oh, egg, I see, I see. Eggplant, yeah, yeah. tomato sauce, mozzarella, like breadcrumbs. Have you ever had it? I haven't had it, but but I'll try it. Yeah, but I'm may. an eggplant fan now. When okay. I when we first put the eggplant in Spelunky one, I was not a fan. Now okay. I'm a fan. Okay. Um, and if you're watching this live now, is your chance to get lore questions. The next lore question, um, and. I, and this is, I guess, a little bit lore, but not so much, is are there any plans to change anything more in the game? Or do you feel like it's you're good, everything's set in terms of... I mean, in terms of, like, you know, major design changes, yeah. it's getting more set. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't want to mess with, like, the design too much aside from fixing like egregious bugs and stuff like that. We'll, we'll keep fixing bugs and we'll keep working on online multiplayer for a pretty long time. But as far as like the basic design of adventure mode, mm -hmm. it's not going to change too much. I think like arena mode will probably keep working on that quite a bit more. But what? yeah, I, for me, like I'm at that point where it's like the game is just kind of set, you know? Mm -hmm. And part of that is is also just battling the you know perfectionism this idea that you 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 know keep tweaking things um forever based on feedback because a lot of uh i don't know i like i like seeing even quote unquote flaws in games and having games kind of be sort of like time capsules for for when they came out and you know i want to look back on spelunky 2 and look at it as this part of my life and not look at it as like this ongoing thing, this, you know, service, whatever that I'm just like continually working on. Like I'm done. I'm going to be, you know, in a few years, I'm going to be in a, a different person again and I'm going to be working on something else. And I'm going to be putting like my new ideas into that. And then Splunky 2 will be Splunky 2. Okay. Next, next question. Uh, what do you think of the Ankh skip and ha was that intended for you or was that like, was that, do you think that was ingenuity on the players figuring it out? Uh, it was both ingenuity and I didn't expect it in that I didn't expect any kind of specific exploits, but I do leave these things open for exploiting because in general, I'm not against exploits. 
they can they can get to degenerate where it's like there's no reason to do anything else and it's just super easy to do mm -hmm. but generally i like them and i hate walling stuff off like with just you know like a hard you're not allowed to do this kind of like it's in the code hard coded in there you can't do it i love leaving things a little bit open generally i love glitches and exploits that are a little harder to pull off mm -hmm. because i just it's a part of video games that i is very uniquely video games and i think it feels really cool when you figure stuff like that off uh, when you figure stuff like that out and when you pull it off so i'm very pro exploit and um you know i've i've said this before but like i really did not like having to put a door to hell in spelunky one mm -hmm. like if you don't have the book of the dead like i did not like that there was just a door there blocking you why didn't you like, like that? i just because it's just it's just like a hard it's like literally a, just a door that you can't get through i just I, I i don't like that idea and if there was a way where you know you could go and somehow find some really crazy way of of like cracking that door open i would love that because i think that kind of stuff is cool and i think it's i always feel like it's a little lame when stuff is just like totally walled off like you have to I go like, from I, I like i like you know puzzles and and challenges to be fuzzy because there, that that's that's where the creativity lies in in playing games you know are there any fuzzy areas in spelunky 2 like areas that you left fuzzy without giving them away because there are some walled off doors and i haven't i haven't run the gamut yet i've been trying but there yeah. are some walled off doors are there fuzzy ways to get into some of the doors that are not more that Derek you of. like okay not that you know and you know like but yeah who knows and I think if somebody when people find ways in that are not intended but are cool and hard to pull off for the average person like I'm happy to just support that you know it's like we did with the eggplant run in Spelunky 1 we found out that you could break the Moai head open with the punish <laughs> ball we just <laughs> Your average person's not going to do that. Like it's, it's still really crazy to do it. So we just, we added some artwork to like actually make it look broken when you break it so that it look, it turned into a feature essentially. <laughs> um, do you have a personal best? Like, do you, do you actively play Spelunky 2 now or now that you're done, you're like, I'm good. Like what do you have like a PB or what's your PB in Spelunky 2? I, I played the game a bunch co-op with my daughter right after it came out and now i'm playing it as just a casual player but my goal is to eventually get all the achievements um I like i want to get my first platinum trophy on playstation because i've never gotten a platinum trophy and i'm like I should, if i get if i do get a platinum trophy it should be in, in this game um with spelunky 2 i just i didn't get to like play it as much like as a player uh, as I did with Spunky One, because the game was just so big, and so the the playing that I did was very much just as a developer, and I used cheats and and our tools a lot to to test stuff. But I didn't get to do as much of the. Okay, I'm just gonna like start a fresh game and just play and try to see how far I can get. I didn't get to do as much of that stuff, honestly. And yeah, that is kind of an excuse to just explain like why i'm like not that great well, I was <laughs> I mean, as far as the, at the, in the game as as uh yeah well in the as, com uh, community on our you. side i already see the headline derek user confirmed resin user around here we say resin is using like hacks and stuff like that so the only way you've beaten your own game is by using resin but that's it you know it's your game you do whatever you want but can i've I been mean, I mean the game normally like plenty of times it's the it's the harder stuff if you that, look, uh, if you use resin, dude, you you made the game. Use resin. That's <laughs> we, uh, we have plenty of great tools in Spelunky <laughs> too that make it very easy to test. Um, a couple more, a couple more quick wrap up questions for you. But can you? I don't want to ask you to promise something, but if you don't mind, as you progressed closer to the platinum trophy, will you tweet out that like, hey, I got this achievement today? I think a lot, a lot of fans would love to like semi follow your journey of actually platinum. Would that be something you'd be open yeah, to? Yeah, no, for sure. I'm going to be very excited and proud of doing that. It'll be my first platinum trophy. And I mean, it, it'll, I'll have 
I've finally like as a player, you know, done done everything I need to in the game. Okay, just just so. a, just a few more quick rapid fire questions. Uh, people are asking about the dice whip. Was that intended yeah. or was that uh, like fuzzy? Someone hacked it. Oh, like when you throw the, the dice and whip, yeah. Yeah, no, that was intended. Okay. Yeah. What was your thought behind that? Like you're cheating the casino. Yeah, I wanted there to be some element of skill to it. Um, honestly, I'm trying to think if that was I, that might be in Spelunky Classic. See, this is this is a, a situation where John Romero would have known the answer to that, and I don't. <laughs> On April seventh. 2009 yeah, like, yeah yeah no because um exactly like on this on this date no it's um it's pretty funny when i was writing the spelunky book and even just working on spelunky 2 i think people would find it funny like how often i i referred to like the spelunky wiki <laughs> that other people wrote and put online to like see how things worked in spelunky 1 because the um yeah, I, I've said this before, but I'm a, I'm a very like intuitive designer. I, I like I said, I approach I approach game making in a similar way to drawing, very visually oriented. So, like the exact numbers, you know that that end up in the game. Um, even when when I I come up with them and I'm like, yeah, you know, this should be sixty and not fifty. Like I I just cannot pull that out of my head uh, in the middle of an interview. I'll be like. <laughs> Checking the Spelunky wiki. I, I have the Spelunky book like on my desk to reference sometimes. <laughs> I feel like reference myself because I just I, I don't remember this stuff. I don't know. My head just gets filled with, with other things. Okay, last last couple of questions. To your knowledge, are all the secrets found in the game? I think all the mechanical secrets are there's are some like little maybe lore based secrets or like visual little visual secrets that that haven't been fully uncovered as far as i know but i don't keep complete track of this well, stuff but as far as i know the mechanical stuff has been what is it completely what was it out. like for you and i and i at twitch chat's got to help me out when the first streamer did went all the way to 99 like was that something that was on your radar and be like yo that was awesome to see that like yeah that i was, was definitely following nocturo the korean streamer mm -hmm. and twiggle as they were, I don't know if they were, I don't know how much they knew about each other. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think at the very least Twiggle was aware of, of Nocturo, but I was kind of watching their friendly competition, I guess, to get to 799 and it was super exciting. It was also super scary because at that point there were still some crash bugs and stuff, especially <laughs> in, in, you know, Cosmic Ocean. Um, although we don't call them crash as we call them succumbing to chaos okay internally yeah all right and uh and so i i do i was aware that like you know i was watching nocturo i think when or maybe i just saw the highlight yeah of him crashing at like 770 something with like a like fully kitted out with an onk and i was just like oh <laughs> that feels bad but then at the same time it was great content for him so i, I try to make myself feel better that way what is and it i did eventually go into his stream and i i subbed and i, I apologize like, sorry man i apologize to uh Hwindwin for for forcing him to succumb to chaos basically <laughs> and i, I promise you've been so gracious with your time i promise you i'm a, just a few more and then it, we're gonna wrap um this is a very specific question. Any plans for it to come to Switch right now? Or that you can talk about? If not, that's okay. I mean, I can't talk about, you know, any of those kinds of plans. That kind of stuff was just, will come when it comes. But, I mean, for game developers, it's like, obviously, at some point, like, yeah. we would love for everybody to, to get, the play, get to play the game. Um, and, yeah, you know, with Splunky 2's development in general, like, we are a relatively small team and so it's kind of been important for us to take it step by step i'm honestly very impressed by the developers that are able to do crazy like simultaneous <laughs> releases and stuff like that it's it's a ton of work like 
I don't know if people realize just how much work it is to get a game on a platform. I mean, even just like setting up the store page, you know, I, I do all that myself and every store page requires like tons of different images of different sizes at the very least on top of writing all the descriptions and getting those localized and stuff like that. So it's a huge amount of effort and so you don't yeah. just, you don't and, just, and Spunky is a it's a it's a very ambitious game actually. I think it's a very unassumingly ambitious game because it's like extremely dense, you know. So so basically, you don't, you don't just copy Spelunky two dot exe to switch via USB, and it, it just doesn't work yeah, like that. No. Right? Okay, All right. just, yeah. just I wish I could just you know take like a CD with Spelunky <laughs> two on it and just like throw it really hard at a new platform and just have it have it go on there but uh yeah it doesn't work that way all right last two questions and then i promise you this is it when you're playing spelunky 2 what is your go-to character like the majority of the time you and and if you don't have one you have to pick one like it's that or you get turned into an eggplant what is your go-to spelunky character? it's guy spelunky you know, when I play with my when I play with my daughter, I'm Guy and she's she's Anna. <laughs> okay, all right. And we sometimes we sometimes mix it up, and I'll play as Manfred Tunnel, and she'll play as Margaret also. <laughs> but for the most part, it's uh, Guy and Anna, and so I'm sticking with Guy. Okay. And last question. Um, before, I do want to bring up one other thing you're working on though, real quick. Is what is your favorite boss in all of Spelunky from beginning to end? Do you have a favorite like? Yeah, nailed that one. Or like that's like if you were to get a tattoo of a boss, this would be the boss <laughs> of, of, your, a of, of your boss. of your own art. Yeah, I'm. I think I'm so happy as with Olmec. Just very simple, crushes you. But in Spelunky, with the mechanics of Spelunky and the physics, it's just. I think it works really well. So you, with game designers, I think we tend to we tend to really like simple solutions, like simple stuff that works really well. Like we really like that. Um, I think for players, I think they tend to like the more complex stuff because they the complexity is usually like a lot of fun to play with. But for designers, <laughs> a simple solution requires so much work like that elegance of you know taking a bunch of complex stuff and making a simple solution out of it like we really love that so i'll say olmec i'll get a giant olmec tattoo right <laughs> here and last thing and i just found this out this morning actually you've been this spelunky 2 is not the only game you've been working on you've been working on 50 others concurrently can you tell us about that because to me i'm like i haven't heard about this and i know you know, you're the cook, bottle washer, you know, you do everything for your game. So there's only so much you can do. But tell us about UFO 50. What is that? And when can we like? Yeah, so UFO 50, it, we started working on it about the same time that we started working on Spelunky 2. And when I say we, it's two different teams working on the two different games. Although Eric and I are on both projects. So... About a year before Spelunky 2's release, Eric and I just focused entirely on Spelunky 2. But before that, we were working on Spelunky 2 and UFO 50. So a lot of people are working on UFO 50. Well, when I say a lot, you know, it's it's relative. But um, I think there are like five people working on it now, and maybe six, like six six or seven total people have worked on it. And yeah, it's a collection of fifty. I would say alternate reality retro games. So the idea is that these games were made by a fictional company from like an alternate reality 80s. And they're like super ahead of their time. But the games still look retro and everything. We just, we created like our own fictional console that this ran on and created a unique palette for it and stuff. And yeah, we were working on that. Me and Eric were working on that concurrently with Spelunky 2 for the first part of development and it actually worked out pretty well like you would i mean it would make total sense to think that we were not able to work on spelunky 2 like as as much because 
Eric and I were doing some work on UFO 50 also. And that might be true just in terms of like time, but I, I found working on the two projects because they were so different that when I worked on UFO 50, it really like refreshed my brain so that when I went back to working on Spelunky 2, like I felt very clear headed about it and was, I, I really felt like I was able to come up with ideas for Spelunky 2 a lot easier. Because another thing that happens when you're working on games is because they take so long to make, you get like kind of foggy headed after a certain point because you're just you're focusing on this project for such a long time and it's you're just like in your your own heads you know if you're working on a team like everybody's working on it together but it's like a small group and you just like you can sort of like lose track of what you're trying to do or you you know you may get the sense like okay you know, is what we're making like good, you know, it, it seems good to us, but because we're kind of in this little hole together working on this, it's hard to know. So I think it was really helpful to have like another project is a little s smaller and easier going with another team. And like in the middle of the development, I kind of ended up treating UFO 50 as like my hobby work from home project, whereas Spelunky 2 was like my day job kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think I sort of separated them in those different ways and it, it ended up working out well. I, I don't recommend that people work on multiple games at the same time. It doesn't always work. I think it really depends on the project, the people, your situation. But for this, it ended up working out. And, Spel and UFO 50 was also like the new idea where Spelunky 2 was the sequel UFO 50, very little expectation for it from anybody because it was a new thing. Spelunky 2, like a lot of expectations, you know, working off of Spelunky 1 and everything. So also the two games like scratched different itches that I had also, which I think was was great and just left me feeling like, I think, very satisfied with my work, even though, yeah, it was it was a lot of work. And, and for you on UFO 50, are they like bite-sized games like when we're talking about 50 games within a game like what are we taught like what are we talking about they're they're full full games they're like full retro games i think um yeah our our goal when we started the project was for them to be full games but maybe smaller than like the bigger games on nintendo entertainment system or something like like that and they really run the gamut. So, you know, the smallest games are like little arcade style, I don't know, Pac-Man-esque kind of games. Those are the smallest. But we do also have, you know, a JRPG in the collection too. <laughs> so we wanted it to feel like, we wanted to feel like these are games that could have actually appeared on a retro console. And the ambition of the games has kind of increased over time. I think that's, that's sort of to be expected, but we're getting to a point now where we can see the end. And especially as Spelunky work starts to wind down a little bit for me, I'm going to start dipping my toes back into UFO 50 again. Is there, but it's Spelunky too. There's been, you know, there's been post-release has been a lot busier than, than I expected. This is definitely the game that I've worked on that has had the most post-release work. Um, and I think I'm also just in like, in a, better headspace now to be able to like deal with this post-release stuff because yeah with, with Spelunky 1 Andy and I were just like pretty burnt out and I think not just psychologically <laughs> in as good a spot to like deal with all the overwhelming feedback and this and that even if it's good even if it's good feedback it can just be so overwhelming like you have to understand like we are not streamers we're game developers and we're just behind our computers just like typing away like uh like little cave moles for for four <laughs> years at a time and then all of a sudden the, the game comes out and it's like everybody wants to talk about it so yeah that's why i i, I do think about that david lynch quote a lot where he's like he got asked you know what does this mean 
and he's his response is just the movie is the thing like everybody ask, wants to ask me like what the movie's about and it's like the movie is the thing it's telling you something just watch the movie i don't do that of course you know i, I answer people's questions but i somehow it makes me feel better that there's somebody out there who who is doing that because um yeah i think uh it's having to talk about the game like i'm i'm just i'm better at working on the game than i am at at talking about it like I think game development I, is my way of of communication like it's my main way of communicating like these creative ideas I, I would I would disagree with that I think I mean you for you to come on and talk and give as much time as you have very dynamic you know which I know is not always the case with not from my experience but some game developers like you're very dynamic on the camera I think a lot of people are really going to enjoy this and a lot of people have enjoyed this live so you know everyone knows you're you know, a legendary game developer, but you know, to you to be able to come on and and to articulate all these things and really share a lot of emotion behind the game, you know, it's been it's been awesome. Well, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having me. I I do enjoy it. You know, like I do enjoy once um once like the interview or whatever has started. Like yeah. I have fun, but it's taken practice for sure. And uh, I think especially after Spelunky one, like I. I, I really was such a cave mole working on that game. And then, you know, when I came out of it, it was, I, I did find it like hard to, I, I think articulate my ideas. So it's, it's taken practice for sure. I, I did read that you said you were able to enjoy this release more like the, the, you know, games out, like you took some time to enjoy it. And my final, final question to you has been, what is now that Spelunky two is out, like, how do you feel? Are you, you feel like great? Like, Hey, this is done relieved. Are you feeling melancholic? Like this is it? Or how do you feel about Spelunky two in, in particular, what it means to you? I feel good. I feel good. I think, I think it was the perfect team to, to work on Spelunky two and, you know, everyone's, everyone's really chill and, um, I, I think I'm in just more of a, like a mature mindset and, uh, having, having my wife and daughter around, I think is really helpful to just like keep me in the, in the right headspace. And yeah, they help me. You know, my, like my wife helps me a lot, just like preparing for this post-release stuff that, that, that shift from game development to. She, the way she put it was like, you're essentially like starting a new career, like in a different field almost. Like it's such a different thing from just working on the game day in, day out. You have this very focused routine to all of a sudden, uh, yeah, going out and, you know, you're doing interviews and marketing, but you're also like fixing bugs, getting feedback and, and doing all this stuff. And the job has changed. And so, yeah, she's helped me a lot, uh, just adapt to that change. Whereas I just didn't have the same, I just, I wasn't as prepared, I think with Spelunky one being, you know, every, every game, fortunately, I, I feel very lucky, but every game has been kind of like a, a step up for me. And, uh, yeah, it's it just, it, ta it takes a lot of help. You know, it takes like, it takes a village to, uh, to make a game and support a game. Thankfully, Blit, they're awesome. Every game release, there there are hiccups, especially if you if you want to do ambitious work. You know, it means you're going to be reaching and you're going to be at kind of the boundary of what you can do with with every game. And they're they've really taken it in stride. You know, like yeah, we were we yeah, we were bummed, for example, that like online multiplayer had was giving people such severe issues when it came out, but they're, they're like super professional about it. They're just like, okay, this is not what we expected, but it is what it is. And we got to, you know, we got to fix it and we were going to do that. And they, they did a, actually a lot of the work setting up like our community stuff. Um, you know, I want to give a shout out to Guillermo who is not only like doing a lot of the hardcore network programming, but he's also done like a ton of work just making our like discord happen and, and 
writing back to people on social media, you know, Reddit and and Steam and and our Discord and stuff like that. Again, you know, indie development, like everyone's wearing lots of different hats and yeah, we are, we are, we're doing our best, but like, they're, they're like super professional and cool about it and just super chill. And that's helped me be chill as well during this, this time. Well, Derek, we want to thank you so much, man. Thank you so much for coming on, talking about your experience and Spelunky too. And, and just being so open and honest, like I said, it for on my end, it, I mean, it's been an absolute joy and pleasure when I got that email, you're like, yeah, I'll do it. I'm like, are you, for real like you're gonna come out of, uh, let's do it so i really you know selfishly it was like such an amazing experience and thank you so much for coming on it was a really big deal on on this side and i know the community loved it too and and we wish you nothing but success and and you know outside of thanking you for your you know time on the podcast thank you for your four or five years of work on this game that everyone really really loves and it's been i mean it's been thanks so much for, fun thanks for playing the game streaming it it's it makes such a huge difference, you know, for developers to have their games streamed and have people, yeah, have people just care about it. And, uh, you know, every, every time you, you yell my name and curse <laughs> me, it does, it does cause me a little pain. You're not you know, supposed like, to know about that. That's just, that's, you know. I mean, even when I'm not watching and I don't hear it, like it, it does hurt me. It's kind of like a voodoo <laughs> doll kind of, kind of thing. Like, I just feel uh, like a little like, oh. <laughs> Dan's uh, cursing me uh, out no, again. no, 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 no. Where are you? Thank you. But, uh, <laughs> thank you for thank you for creating the game at which I no, can curse great. at you. No, I, yeah. I, I love it. No, it, it's super, it's been super fun watching the streams, watching your YouTube and uh Olmec Chess. I will I saw people I, mention that I didn't want to in go the chat. there. They wanted to hear about what I thought about it. And uh you know, I, I hate it. You're blacklisted after this. No, no, it was it was, it was really funny and Honestly, it was that aspect of Olmec was something we were thinking about um, fixing. But when I saw <laughs> when I saw you playing Olmec chess, I'll be honest. I went to our Slack and I was like, I posted the video and I was like, "All right, we got to change this." <laughs> chat, I'm mad. I'm mad at chat. This was not supposed to come up. No, Anyways. it was it was funny, and it's it's good. Like that kind of feedback is good because at any given point, there's so much stuff we're thinking about. So it's like, you know, when the trailer came out and people were talking about the art being too flat, like that made me, you know, it made me like redirect my energy, you know, toward toward the art for a bit, which is good because you can. There's so many little rabbit holes you can just go into with game development, and it's very easy to just get focused on one thing and just be driving down that that hole. But you got to look at the game in its in its totality, and so it really helps to know what players are caring about. And uh, yeah, no, so I, Olmec Chess was was awesome, and you know, I it doesn't I don't feel bad about the bug because like it it made some great content. For the stream, you know, it, it did, but I just want to be very clear. Like, I'm, I'm a movie watcher, right? Like, you're George Lucas. I'm like, I trust Derek. You, whatever he wants to have happen. Like, I'm not, because at the same time, like, I'm not here to criticize your game. Like, you've made classics. You made things that are so fun to play. Like, I've never developed a game. I'm not going to say anything, you know, because I just have fun yeah, like, with what you make. The, the criticism, the criticism is is good. Um, you know, obviously. As game developers, we always appreciate it when the criticism is put forth in a constructive manner, right? Like we we appreciate that, but but ultimately, well, I'll, I'll just speak for myself personally because I think every developer looks at feedback in in a different way. But for me personally, like I appreciate it, and um, you know, I I remember a time where people did not care about as much about my games as, as they do now. And so I, I just try to look at it as people caring. I can't think of a better way to, I mean, I didn't, even, I didn't see Olmec chess as a criticism per se, but I can't think of a better way to give feedback than, <laughs> to, you know, to make something fun. I'm just trying it. to beat Olmec and not die. That's all I was trying to do. Yeah. But Well, there, anyways, thanks for having me. The, the sun is now like, I'm like starting to just disappear into the ether <laughs> and uh, disintegrate. 
well, with the sunlight on me. So, Derek, once again, thank you so much. We all love the games you made. You know, we're enjoying the heck out of Spelunky too, and enjoying the moment now. And we'll be watching, you know, UFO fifty once you relax and just you know take some time off from making another masterpiece back to back. So, thank you awesome. so much for coming on, Derek. We really appreciate it. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, and thanks, chat. Thanks everyone for. Playing Spelunky or, you know, watching Dan play it. And be sure you're, you're Derek U on Twitch, right? Are you Derek on U on Twitch? Twitch? Yeah. No, I'm Mossmouth TV. Okay. So everyone follow Mossmouth on Twitch. So when he decides to stream his first game development, we'll, we'll know. And, and you'll have yeah, a... I'll, I'll tweet when I do. I don't think it's going to be anytime, like, really soon. I, I would have to find something that I would want to stream. I don't know, maybe UFO 50. It'll be complete chaos, I'm sure. But. <laughs> well, and we look forward to seeing your tweets about your, your progression towards your own platinum on your own game. That, that you Thank you. So. All right, Derek, thanks so much, <laughs> the man. The nice thing about making a roguelike is you can, you can have a lot of surprises playing it yourself. <laughs> All right, Derek, thanks so much.